Hi, welcome to Superhero Rundown. I'm Crimson, and today we're going to be focusing on some of the women in Doctor Who. Normally, it would be a single episode, but there are so many important women in the Doctor Who universe. I'm not calling it the Hooniverse. You can't have that. The point here is that this is going to be a mini-series? There are going to be multiple episodes on Doctor Who's women. Today, we'll be covering Ace, 13, and the TARDIS herself. There aren't set metrics with judging the women of Doctor Who, but I would like to say we're going to talk about what makes them special. Let's start with the TARDIS herself, which has been there since the beginning of the series, much like the Doctor themselves. Now we see the TARDIS throughout the series, but we specifically see her talk to the Doctor during the Doctor's Wife in the 11th Doctor era. Neil Gaiman had suggested that they make an episode centering on the TARDIS itself, which had never been done before. The result is Idris, the woman where the TARDIS matrix was deposited, so the villain, House, can take the TARDIS to the universe. While that's happening, Amy and Rory are trapped in the TARDIS. We'll talk about Amy in a different episode, but for now, let's refocus on the TARDIS, or as the Doctor calls her, sexy. After a weird introduction, the Doctor confronts Idris and proves that she's the TARDIS and tells him that she stole him. What makes you think I would ever give you back? And as you think back through Doctor Who canon, sometimes when the Doctor gets mad at the TARDIS, they always solve the problem she has dropped them in, even if it also means death and regeneration. Idris realizes the body she has been deposited in is dying, so she and the Doctor go to the junkyard and see if they can build a working console, because the companions need the Doctor and nothing will stop them. By the way, the Doctor is a they-them, since both women and men have been the Doctor. You can complain about this in the comments that I will not be reading. The Doctor chides the TARDIS for never taking them where they wanted to go, but the TARDIS tells them that she always took them where they are needed. They get to Amy and Rory, and the TARDIS defeats House. She tells the Doctor that she will always be there for him. After the Doctor protects the TARDIS Matrix with a firewall, Rory asks if he has a room. But the Doctor is always in his room, with his wife. Cat Smith explains why this episode is so important. That's what Gaiman does. The whole episode is a love letter to the show, the Doctor and the TARDIS. Any Whovian can tell you that the TARDIS, the Doctor's time and spaceship, has anthropomorphized over the years. It's not a set piece or a prop, it's a character. People cosplay the TARDIS. Neil took that idea, shaped it, and now TARDIS cosplayers can suit up in a Victorian looking frock if they want to, instead of just variations on a blue box. Not to mention, Gaiman reintroduced the word Petrichor back into our lives. I love Petrichor, it's so peaceful. Charlie Coyle elaborates on the relationship of the TARDIS and the Doctor. This dynamic of ownership allows viewers to believe the relationship between Idris and the Doctor is one of equals, and insofar as intelligence, experience, and clever dialogue are concerned, they are. Because the two have shared hundreds of years together, they are able to hold conversations in which both parties contribute equally, and there is no need for halting explanations of spacey wacy subjects, unlike many Doctor Companion conversations. Well. Now that we took a look at the TARDIS, let's take a look at one of her pilots, the 13th Doctor, as portrayed by Jodie Whittaker. She builds herself a sonic screwdriver, which is kind of great, because let's face it, normally the TARDIS gives the Doctor their screwdriver, at least in the new series. She also talks much faster than 12. It's honestly refreshing in a way. Not just that, but her journey is actually a lot of fun and upbeat. It's a more optimistic era, especially after all the anger and sadness after the Time War. I also loved that she went shopping for a new look instead of raiding the wardrobe as the TARDIS was missing. And of course, she does things that the Doctor does. She saves the universe. She helps people. She cares for her companions. She believes that all living things need dignity and death. And of course, she takes her companions to see the universe. She even cements her identity. I'm the Doctor. A Doctor of Medicine. Problems. People. Hope. Mostly hope. Plus she says the realest thing in life. This is not the way to resolve a family dispute. How about good old fashioned passive aggressive discussion? What, you guys don't do that with your family? There are also shades of other doctors. She uses Nitro 9, which Ace used in the seventh doctor era. She talks to the TARDIS like most doctors before her. And of course she has her speeches as the doctor. The concept of a female doctor was first mentioned after Tom Baker suggested his successor could be a woman. So it's not exactly new, 
but it should be mentioned that women have only been cast as the doctor in humor roles, like in The Curse of the Fatal Death. Not to mention that Missy, who I'll also be covering in a later episode of this miniseries, was a woman incarnation of the master. So how did the reception go? Well, it wasn't exactly a warm reception, and people criticized the writing under the new showrunner, Chris Chibnall. But to be fair to 13, every Doctor has had some bad episodes. 13 has as many episodes as the 6th. But if you won't take my word for it, Matthew Jasper explained that a United Kingdom government minister accused the 13th casting had led to the rise of male crime. Whitaker, who is set to hand over the role to the 14th Doctor, makes a powerful point of women being scapegoated for the actions of men, seemingly in lieu of addressing the core of any real problem. Fans have praised Whitaker for being a positive inspiration to young girls in her position, something which has been documented before in fan responses to shows like The X-Files, whose co-lead, Dana Scully, inspired several women to go into STEM in a phenomenon called the Scully Effect. However, Whitaker also seems to suggest that women can make great role models for boys, and that it is healthy to see people from all different backgrounds in any given media diet. I will say that being spread around three companions is difficult, and some of it does seem half-assed, like Ryan's disability of dyspraxia, only being mentioned a handful of times, but we can criticize the handling of the disability later. While Gaz's romance with the Doctor does seem organic, it's only really explored for an episode, whereas the romance with Rose was over multiple seasons and she got a doctor to grow old with. I'm not mad about Donna. I swear I'm not. I... Flames. Flames on the side of my face, and if he doesn't fit... The portrayal was not without some flaws. For example, Historically, companions are used as an audience surrogate to both explore and react to the many worlds the Doctor is capable of showing us. But it's also through her connections with these characters that we're able to see the Doctor herself change and grow as a character. Whether that's Nine finding his joy again through Rose or Twelve's slow path to opening his heart with Clara. But with three companions in the TARDIS and only 50 minutes of story to go around each week, there's little chance for similar relationships to truly develop. But that's not all. Lauren Coates explains a lot of the flaws of the 13th era, including her gender not coming up. What's frustrating, though, is that the series doesn't treat her like the men who have come before. Doctor Who refuses to engage with her gender, seemingly terrified of mischaracterizing their first female Doctor. In their hand-wringing over how to approach this new incarnation, the series also neglects to give 13 a love interest, marking her as the only post-reboot Doctor to be devoid of any romantic relationships. It's a glaring indicator that, even with nearly three seasons under its belt, Doctor Who still isn't sure how to approach writing a female Doctor. But that viewpoint is innately misguided. Like it or not, being a woman doesn't fundamentally make the 13th Doctor different from her predecessors. This doesn't mean that the Doctor herself needs to drastically change, but being perceived as a woman changes how others interact with the Doctor. And instead of taking advantage of this change and embracing the opportunity to explore new interpersonal dynamics between a female Doctor and the rest of the universe, Doctor Who skirts around it. The only exceptions to this is the episode The Witchfinders, where James I makes a remark about how she is a woman and Graham covers for her. The only other time is when she first discovers she's a woman. But other than that, they don't really bring it up. Okay, so one character, the TARDIS, having critical acclaim and 13 reception being divided. But is there someone else who can really show how cool women in Doctor Who can be? Get on level three. Three calling small. That's right, Ace. Or Dorothy, if you want to piss her off. A woman found on an ice planet and starts traveling with the Doctor, specifically Seven, whom she affectionately calls Professor. Not only that, she also invented Nitro-9. She's resourceful enough to help the companions and the Doctor, and she has good banter with the Doctor. Please, give me some of that Nitro-9 that you're not carrying. Here you can be King of England. After she almost drowned, she runs headlong into danger, like a badass. The Doctor lectures her about not bringing anachronisms into the past because it can mess up the timeline. Which, to be fair, is probably a good conversation to have with her. 
She also admits that no one is perfect, mostly as an excuse for her errors, and she even freely admits when she's scared. But the doctor isn't afraid to scold her when things get bad, even though they believe in her abilities. She also learns to ask the right questions while traveling with the doctor. And she's also in the power of the doctor. And they show her investigating things with Tegan, that she has her stuff in unit headquarters, and that she has made a more powerful version of Nitro 9 called Nitro 999. She even beats the shit out of a Dalek with a bat, again, which is always a treat. And she was well received. Addie Tentmed explains that Ace is a social justice warrior companion. And that's not a bad thing, because her run never really ended. We never saw her leave the doctor. Ace was the nickname of Dorothy, a teenager from the London suburb of Paravale, who was more than happy to go around causing chaos with the doctor. Kids related to her, or wanted to be like her. She wore a bomber jacket festooned with CND and probably Rock Against Racism badges, and spoke like they did. She was the most overt social justice warrior out of all the companions, and nobody ever complained. So Ace is a lot better received than some other companions. Everyone has their favorite companion, but mine is Ace. I hope you enjoyed this brief look at the women of Doctor Who, because I have no idea when I'm doing another one. <laughs>